in that year that we won a national championship, right? We're gonna play 40, 41 games, 42 games, maybe, somewhere, somewhere in that area. And so those will be the moments that the public will judge whether we're doing a good job. And I get that. And if we don't do well enough in those games, we won't coach here very long. I get that. And if we do well, we'll continue to coach here a really long time. But they're 365 days in a year, most of the time. And so if I only focus on the 40 or 45, then I'm really missing out on all those other opportunities, 320 some odd opportunities to make an impact on a young person's life that may not be given that same chance again to help them understand that you can be more than a basketball player, that getting an education does get you ahead in life, uh, that being a good person does still have value. And so while we're as competitive as possible, and we want to beat all the teams that come in this building and we want to go on the road and we want to go 42 and all and win a national championship, I can't forget that 90% of the year isn't played on the court. And so we got to really focus on who they are as people and make sure that they understand that they're more than the result that we see uh, in those 40 minute games, 40 times a year. How does it feel to be back with your team for another year? Uh, it feels really good. I, um, you know, been, been fortunate that we've had uh, a little bit more time with this particular team than we normally do because we, uh, we took a foreign tour this summer. And that gave us an opportunity to um, not just do our normal summer um, entry program, but really get to the meat of practices uh, 10 times before we went on that trip. And then the trip itself was a pretty unique experience because we were obviously in a foreign country, foreign to us, uh, where you know, we're not familiar with all the customs and culture and had to kind of get to know each other in a different kind of environment. So I was really satisfied with what came from that uh, and really looking forward to seeing how we can continue to build this particular team. Where did you guys go this summer? So we took a 10 day trip to Spain. Uh, we went to Madrid, Valencia and Barcelona. Uh, in between uh, Valencia and Barcelona, we stopped in Cambros for a little bit of a catamaran cruise in the Mediterranean. So that was a pretty cool experience as well. What was your favorite part of that trip that did not include basketball? Uh, just watching you know, guys who I thought would get along, um, get along and, and find ways to connect with one another, but also seeing guys you know, experience things that they had never experienced before. Uh, and do it with a bunch of guys who are fairly new to them. Uh, Mike Marsh probably stands out the most in the sense that he had never really flown before uh, and obviously took a fairly long flight this time, uh, but he also had never swam. And you know, we're out on that cruise and, and everyone's jumping in the water and enjoying themselves. Mike's kind of hanging in the back corner of the boat and his teammates start to slowly encourage him to get in the water and uh, it took some pride and coaching and, and pushing and encouragement, but he ultimately got in and, and um, kind of conquered a fear of, of maybe something he maybe thought he couldn't do. Uh, but at the same time, it was unique to see our guys rally around each other and be able to support one another and encourage the teammate to, to trust them uh, that he would be okay. How do you think he did on that long flight. I know it's not direct from Oklahoma, but that's that's not a short trip for someone's first time or one of their first times on a plane. Yeah, it actually was direct from DFW, from Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, it was about 10 hours uh, from Dallas-Fort Worth to Madrid. And, um, you know, I think he was worried a little bit, but, you know, again, he was with a bunch of guys who at that point he had known for a couple months and felt like, hey, if we're gonna do this together, then I'll be okay. So I think the trip the flight he was much more comfortable with, uh, but getting in the water was a big chore for him. And uh, so to see him really, you know, knock that off a list of fears uh, was something that was pretty cool to watch. There are a lot of new faces in your locker room this season. How does a trip like that help expedite building camaraderie? Yeah, I mean, you hope that it, it would obviously allow some uh, voices to emerge in terms of leadership. Um, not only on the court, but also in terms of how guys conduct themselves off the court. Uh, I think it's given us the, the few guys who are returning a little bit of, uh, more of a voice in, in terms of what the expectations are within our team. Uh, so a lot had fallen on the shoulders early of Bryce Thompson and Keon Williams and John Michael Wright. 
Uh, and they all handled it really, really well. Uh, helped not only our freshmen, but even our transfers, who you know, one has a couple years, a couple of those guys are only going to be here for one year. Those returners really helped them, you know, kind of learn pretty quickly what we expect as coaches, uh, what the expectations are of our program from our fan standpoint, and what they want to accomplish as a group this year, which is having the most success on the court possible, but at the same time making sure that our fans are very proud of the product they see on the court. Coach, I don't know if you remember telling me this, but last summer we spoke before the season and you said that you have a way of connecting geography and food. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, what was the best thing you ate in Spain? I mean, I had some of the best uh, seafood that I've ever tasted, uh, and I'm a big seafood uh, fan. But I have to admit, I never really had paella, which is a traditional dish in Spain, Valencia specifically. Uh, and I was really, really impressed with just the flavorfulness, the freshness. Um, learned that I, you know, ate some rabbit, and I think I ate rabbit for the first time on that trip, and uh, it's quite delightful. How did your guys do with eating international cuisine? I think one of the things we try to do is not tell them what they were eating as much as maybe you usually would. Because again, there's something that, you know, maybe seems awkward about eating rabbit or whatever other kind of animal that we may have been eating over there. Um, so there were a few times that we just gave them the food and let them eat it and then we told them afterwards. And we had a couple guys that actually said that they liked it when they ate it and then all of a sudden they didn't like it after they knew what it was. And I said, it really doesn't work like that. <laughs> so, what were some of the things that... I like the rabbit okay. uh, or the fish. Um, and some guys were, you know, again, cleaning their plates and then we told them, you know, this is what it was. And they're like, oh, that's disgusting. I'm like, no, you actually enjoyed it. It wasn't disgusting. It was pretty good. To be fair, Oklahoma is a landlocked state and not exactly the seafood capital this is of true. the world. So I, I can forgive them for not wanting to try fish, although I am a huge seafood person. You've been in practice a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Recently, you had an open practice. Yeah. How was that experience? It was cool. Uh, sort of a, uh, an idea we had just because we were playing a football game that evening and thought, you know, let's give our fans an opportunity if they're around to watch the football game, a chance to, to get a first look at a lot of these new players, uh, start familiarizing themselves with the faces and the jersey numbers and the names. Uh, and, you know, they have read about all these guys at some point uh, prior to that, but many of them hadn't seen any of these guys. So for them to be able to get a firsthand look at, you know, kind of the early stages of what our team is right now uh, and be able to create some expectations on how we can grow from here, but also get excited about coming out in about a month and start to enjoy how these guys work together in games. Uh, we're about a month out from the season and I'm looking forward to seeing how much better we can improve from November 6th on our first game to you know, hopefully late March. How do you think the fans enjoyed the open practice? I think the response, at least from my perspective, was phenomenal. Um, again, there wasn't a whole lot of advertising. We didn't market this thing for a long time. It was an idea we had as a staff to maybe open the doors. Uh, and you know, the number of people that showed up was sort of surprising for me. Not because I don't think people care. I do think our fans care a lot. It's just that they didn't have a lot of time to plan for it. And so I'm sure a lot of them had other plans for tailgating or visiting with friends while they were in town uh, before the game. But to see how many people showed up and took a roster sheet and started to try to study it uh, was pretty impressive. How many people do you think were there? I'm bad at guessing numbers like that. Um, but it was certainly much more. I mean, I thought if 25 people showed up, that would have been great. And we certainly had a lot more than that. What does that say about Oklahoma State fans and their devotion to athletic programs here? Yeah, it's one of the things that we highlight in recruiting all the time. Uh, we talk about how passionate our fan base is, how much they care about the success of our teams, uh, which sometimes can create some challenging expectations when you don't meet them. Uh, but also, it gives you an opportunity to know that you're playing for something meaningful. You're playing for people who really have brought in to what this program means. And one of the unique things about this school is that so many of our fans are alums. Like this is their school. Like they, they, I don't, they don't die, but they, they live and they, they angst with every result um, on every play sometimes in, in, in certain sports. But, um, you know, to see our guys be able to look up and see, you know, several hundred people watching them just practice 
with nothing really on the line, um, with still the season a month away, I think goes to show that what we say in recruiting is real. That you come here and you get the support of people uh, that maybe you didn't know, but that you become like family. And so our guys will kind of lean into that and hopefully we'll be able to repay that, you know, um, commitment and that persistency of our fans with how we play on the floor. You were a college player yourself, played in South Carolina. How did those fans compare to Stillwater fans? Yeah, it's different. It's totally different. Um, in fact, I, I would say in many ways, with all due respect to my alma mater, this is a basketball school. Um, it's been that way because the great coaches in the history of basketball really laid the foundation of what this program was going to be about. And, and that started with Mr. Ibo way back in the 40s and helping our program become the first ever to win back-to-back -back national championships. Um, and then one of his mentees, uh, Coach Sutton, returned here and brought the program back to great glory in the, and then throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s when I was in school. Uh, and so I think because of that, there's just this fabric of, of winning and expectations of winning that's here that doesn't exist at many places, not just my alma mater, in basketball in particular especially when you have a really good football program as well. And so the combination of having a program that's had success, uh, that's, cr that's uh, produced several guys who've gone on to play in the NBA, uh, just creates a different level of uh, pride and expectation when it comes to what basketball means at Oklahoma State. The 2023-24 season tips off in less than a month. How are you feeling entering this upcoming season? I was a little anxiety always, you know, uh, we feel good about the roster we've been able to put together. Uh, it's a different time in recruiting, no doubt, with the transfer portal and, and the uh, influence of NIL and the decisions that young people make. Uh, but we feel like we put together a roster that can be really, really competitive and what's going to be, again, the best basketball conference in America in the Big 12, adding four new teams and, and Houston, who's been nationally prominent for the last 10 years or so with Coach Sampson. Uh, BYU, who you know, when we go down senior day, there'll be guys being honored there that they will have their children there with them, not just their parents. Uh, then a program like Central Florida, who's up and coming, almost beat Duke in the NCAA tournament a few years back, and, and Cincinnati, who's been as strong you know, on a national scale as anybody over the course of their history. They haven't been as much nationally relevant recently, but they have a they have an identity as a basketball program. And that doesn't include all the teams that we've been facing for the last six years. When you talk about Kansas and Baylor and Texas Tech and Kansas State who had a remarkable run. So the, the competition in our league, right, creates an expectation of you better be on your A game. And so I'm excited to see how these guys, again, from now to the end of the season, improve and gel and be able to meet those matches. You mentioned the four new additions to the Big 12. Which school are you most excited to go visit and play? Well, I've been to all of them except BYU. Um, in fact, we've played Houston multiple times since I've been a head coach. I have such respect uh, for Coach Sampson. He's actually one of my mentors and a very, very good friend. Um, I know they'll be a tough out. You know, uh, we played them at their place only this year. They don't come here, so that'll be a challenging game. But I've not been to BYU, so that's one. Just because of that, I'm looking forward to at least visiting for the first time. Have you been to Utah? Uh, I've been to the state of Utah, but I've not been on their campus and certainly have never been in their athletic venues. Only a few weeks into practice, I realize there's still a lot of room to grow and learn. So far, based on what you've seen from your team, where do you think they've improved the most from last year? Well, I think the team is just so different. Uh, our skill set as a group. Um, our team last year was much more athletically dominant. Um, we had a defensive presence that, you know, I don't know if I've been around as much in my basketball life. Um, had a really tremendous shot blocker, had two guys who could really, really guard the basketball. Um, and this year's team, while we're still good defensively, we're not dominant defensively, but we're much better on the offensive end, in all honesty. We shoot the ball better, we pass the ball better. Um, our bigs are more skilled in terms of their ability to step out and make plays um, without just running and dunking. And so that's what I'm looking forward to the most is trying to put those skill pieces together figuring out can we get a Bryce Thompson uh, and a Keon Williams to gel with a guy like Eric Daly who's new, uh, but who can play multiple positions anywhere from one through four 
Uh, can we get a guy like Connor Dow who can shoot the ball as well as anybody I've coached so far to find a fit uh, with a guy like Mike Marsh or Isaiah Miranda who he hasn't played with before. So th those are the things that I'm looking forward to as a coach, you know, kind of putting the pieces together. How important is let's work to your coaching mentality and style? You know, truly, uh, let's work is everything about my life. It, it's, a, it's a life identity point for me uh, because it signifies two things. First is the work, right? Uh, work is the foundation of everything I've been about my whole life. Um, it's given me a chance to be successful uh, to whatever degree I've been successful at this point because I'm not that talented. <laughs> um, it's just an average person who just has found a way to work as hard as he possibly can in everything he did. So that's the foundation of it. But the let's part is equally important because the, the word itself, L-E-T apostrophe S, is inclusive of everybody. Not just our players, but our staff, our fans, our former players. So it's about everybody within the program or connected to the program doing their part. For fans, it's showing up to the games. For our season ticket holders, it's making sure if they can't come that someone's able to sit in that seat. For our students, it's making sure that they can feel a part of our program. And obviously for our players, it's doing everything they can to honor that commitment from our fans, to play the right way. Uh, to give our team the best chance to win every game, to play unselfishly. Uh, and so let us all work is what that really means. Let us all do all of the things that may be uncomfortable, but that give us the best chance to have success. Because when we win on the court, everybody has a chance to enjoy the part of that process. You're talking about everybody, it's all inclusive. That relates to your life on campus as well. You are everywhere. You show up at every event. You are there for the fans. Why is showing up off the court for other sports teams or campus events important to you? Because I also think that that, that should be reciprocated. The things that I'm asking our fans, our students, our, our staff on campus within the athletic department to, to be supportive of us, right? We need to make sure that they know that it's not a one-way street, that I need to go out and support Colin Carmichael and his soccer team. I need to be at Boone Pickens Stadium supporting Coach Gundy and his football team. I need to be on campus supporting the, you know, student government club or the Greek houses or whatever. Even a, maybe a faculty group on campus uh, because that's how you build community. That's how you build support. That's how you get through difficult moments. But it's also how you enjoy the most the success you have. You've found your niche in Stillwater, as I said, you are everywhere, but you're from the East Coast, I you're am. from Brooklyn. Brooklyn and the East Coast are very different from Stillwater. How long did it take you to settle in and adapt to life here? Oh man, I don't know if I could pinpoint a time frame, but I know I always felt really comfortable with the people here. Um, you know, the fact that I could drive on 35 and look out and see miles and miles and miles of state <laughs> is different for me. Um, used to not being able to see two blocks because they're buildings, you know, just popping up out of the ground everywhere. Uh, so that part culturally has been different. To see all the animals that you see when you drive around in an agricultural laden area, uh, very different for me. But the people here are very similar to the people I grew up around. Very welcoming, uh, very supportive. Uh, my family was really close. The people here represent an extension of that. And so in different ways, I adjusted at different moments. Um, but I can tell you I feel at home here right now. I'm from the East Coast too. Mm -hmm. When people ask where I'm from, I struggle with that. Or where, where do you live? Because I live in Oklahoma, but I'm not from Oklahoma. Sure. You just called Stillwater home. Yeah. How long did it take for you to realize, to start saying this place is home? Wow. Uh, so when I first moved here as an assistant coach, in, in all honesty, I really didn't want to come here. Uh, not because I had anything against Stillwater or the state of Oklahoma. I didn't know anything about it. The reason I didn't want to come is because I wanted to be the head coach where I was leaving. Uh, I had an, had an opportunity to interview for that job when my then boss left to come take this job. And so I came up here sort of reluctantly. And um, my, my wife and I, we, we rented a house for a year. Uh, because we weren't sure this is where we we're going to be for a long time. Uh, but God works in mysterious ways. And I became the head coach just a year later. And I felt like that was a sign for me to just unpack my bags, you know, get comfortable. We bought a house uh, that our players then could come and enjoy 
as much as possible. And um, I think immediately started to feel like, you know what? This is a place we need to just lean into and embrace. And our kids really only know this place. We've got a 10-year-old son uh, named Ace and an a eight-year-old daughter named Zoe. They've really, I mean, neither one of them were born in Oklahoma. Our son was born in South Carolina. Our daughter was born in Texas. But they don't really know either of those places. Uh, they really only know Oklahoma as home. And so usually where your kids call home is where you then decide to call home because that's where the base and the roots of your family is. And so that had a lot to do with it. But again, it goes back to the people. You know, when I'm around in this community, whether I'm at Louis or Sprouts or even Walmart sometimes, uh, because my wife does send me to Walmart every now and then to get bread or milk, um, people are just so inviting and welcoming and helpful. And, and that certainly makes us feel really, really comfortable. Where is your wife from originally? She's from Michigan. So also a, a, a coastal person. Um, Holland, she played, went to college at Virginia Tech and played volleyball there. Uh, then got her master's at the University of Florida. Uh, she's a sports dietitian. So we've all been in athletics, you know, both of us, all of our lives. And so our kids really don't have a choice. Uh, but I always joke that you know, I'm married up like most men do. My wife's 6'1". She's beautiful. Uh, so she's better looking than I am. She's got two degrees. So she's smarter than I am. And then if you put a golf club in her hand and my hand, you'll see that she's more athletic than I am as well. Your wife sounds pretty awesome. She's pretty awesome. Is she still working with the athletic department here? She does. Um, a little bit more of a part-time basis, uh, considering all the busy things she has going on with our own kids. But she consults with you know, several of our athletes on you know, food choices and you know, some kids struggle with body image when they get to college or weight gain versus weight losses and expectations of their coaches in that regard. Uh, so she tries to lend her expertise in that regard as well. You're entering your seventh season with the Cowboys. You've settled in nicely. How do you think you've grown as a person and a coach since year one as the head coach? Well, I think part of it is I know right now that I know so little when I first started this. You have an idea of what you want to do and how you want to accomplish the things on your list of accomplishments, um, how you want to recruit, uh, but you learn that you have to adapt each year to maybe a different group. And now you're having to adapt more than ever before because roster turnover is at an all-time high. And so what I've learned is as much as I feel like I know what I want to do, I'm not in control of that. Right? I've got to have great people surrounding me. Uh, my staff is so critical to the level of success that we're able to have. We've got to give them the resources that they need. Uh, and then I've got to support our players you know, through all types of situations. Uh, what most people don't know is they just watch the game, but they don't know when you know, a young man's mom has been diagnosed with an illness or maybe a grandparent has passed during that week. They just see the game and watch the result and then they take it for what it is. It's just the game in a vacuum. Uh, but as coaches, we got to support these kids through those moments. We've had kids have to miss games because they've been at funerals. Uh, we had a young man have to leave our foreign trip because of the death of a family member very close to him. And so th that's where the coaching really comes in, is how do you handle those moments when you really need to be there for the kids outside of the game. But as far as basketball, the expectations haven't changed at all. My ultimate goal is to win a Big 12 championship and put Oklahoma State in position to win their third national championship. And uh, the work won't be finished until we get you know, to those to those goals accomplished. And so, you know, it's a tall task. I know it seems maybe far fetched to talk like that, but I believe if you don't if you don't think you can talk about it, then it's really, really hard to be able to go out and do it. So we're gonna keep talking about it until we make it happen. Coach, I wanna go back to what you said about helping the kids off the court and dealing with the adversity mm -hmm. and grief. How do you do that as a coach while also worrying about the kids? on the court going out to play that game? For me, it's really easy, actually. Um, they're people first. And I always put this perspective on it. In that year that we won a national championship, right, we're going to play 40, 41 games, 42 games, maybe, somewhere, somewhere in that area. And so those will be the moments that the public will judge whether we're doing a good job. And I get that. And if we don't do well enough in those games, we won't coach here very long. I get that. And if we do well, we'll continue to coach here a really long time. 
but they're 365 days in a year, most of the time. And so if I only focus on the 40 or 45, then I'm really missing out on all those other opportunities, 320 some odd opportunities to make an impact on a young person's life that may not be given that same chance again, to help them understand that you can be more than a basketball player, that getting an education does get you ahead in life, uh, that being a good person does still have value. And so while we're as competitive as possible, and we wanna beat all the teams that come in this building and we wanna go on the road, and we wanna go 42 and all and win a national championship, I can't forget that 90% of the year isn't played on the court. And so we gotta really focus on who they are as people and make sure that they understand that they're more than the result that we see uh, in those 40 minute games 40 times a year. How do you help the fans understand that? That's a good question. And, and partly I, I, I respect the fans' perspective because I'm a fan also, right? Um, I want our guys to win all the time. I want them to do all the things that we tell them to do exactly right. Uh, I want to get up by 20 and win by 40 every night. I just know that's not reality. And I know that it's hard for guys to really understand how to be focused as much as they're distracted now every single day. And so for fans, you just have to understand that they have a different perspective. You have to respect their perspective and understand that it's different. Um, but at the same time, I tell our fans, you know, I never show up to anybody's office and try to tell them how to do their job. When I go and I need, you know, something done at a doctor's office, I usually kind of listen to what the doctor has said because he practices medicine every day. And so just trust. Over time, we'll either prove that we're good enough or we're not. And if we're not, they'll move on to somebody else. Uh, but I respect our fans because of the time and commitment that they show to us uh, almost all the time, you know. And I'm sure they get frustrated when they don't see the results as consistently, uh, maybe as they want, but we're the same. Um, they, their expectations aren't higher than ours. Uh, they want to win, we want to win more, I promise you. And our guys want to win more than anybody. And so I think if I could get them to understand that, uh, we don't fall short because we want to or because we're trying to miss the free throws at the end or, or miss the three-pointers or not defend. Uh, it's just because sometimes the other team's a little bit better at it. And our job over time is to try to improve from the beginning of the season to the end every year. What are your expectations for this season? I want to be a better team on March 6th than we are on November 6th. And that sounds like a cliche coach thing to say. But I really believe that if you just focus on that process and you have the right people, then the results will take care of themselves. Now, there are some things that are out of your control. Injury, illness, we've experienced both that have affected our seasons from time to time. But if you can stay away from that, which you don't have any control over, then just continue to put your head down and do the work every day. When you went on the road and you feel good, you gotta come back and show up and do your job the next day. When you lose a disappointing game at home and everyone's walking around here feeling sad, you gotta show up the next day and do your job as best as you can. And if you stay committed to that process, that's where the let's work goes back into, like, let's just get back to that. Let's work today, let's work tomorrow, take care today, go to the next day, get to next week, and keep that mentality. And um, I really believe that our team has a chance to be one of the most competitive teams in our league, which gives you a chance to be nationally relevant. What does this team have to prove? Yeah, I try to stay away from that because that introduces other people's expectations into the fold. What I always tell our guys is they've got to prove to each other that they're trustworthy individually. Each guy on the team has to prove that they can be counted on to do their jobs the best that they can every day. Does that mean they're gonna perform their best? No, but that their attitudes are gonna be positive, they're gonna be encouraging, they're gonna be coachable. And again, if they focus on that, then it's on us as coaches to make sure we put them in the right positions.